I actually know this poem by heart, so I'm actually pretending to read it to you, but, I, <laughs> but I, better, I better stay anchored to the page anyway. Uh, cold reading. It's really cold in here now, easily 40 below something, and half the class is asleep. Snow dazzles in the windows, makes a cake of each desk. It's really cold in here now. I've been lecturing on the same poem for 26 hours, and half the class is asleep. I want them to get it. I start to talk about death again, and it's really cold in here now. One student has frozen solid, her hair snapping off in the wind, and half the class is asleep. See that, I say? Lisa gets it. But it's so cold in here now, half the class are white dunes shifting to the sea. In your book, um, Birth and Girl with Possum, you have a poem entitled uh, 1981. And you say in the, in the poem, a woman asked me to touch her body. I did. I wrote my first poem. It said that people were like moons. I think you were 15 when you wrote uh, your first poem, is that right? So I was about 15, and uh, uh, wow, you've uh, thrown me. Uh, <laughs> uh, because I'm thinking, of, I've, uh, I'm thinking about several things right now. I'm thinking about the poem, I'm thinking about the woman, I'm thinking about uh, my self-consciousness about the poem, mm -hmm. and my self-consciousness uh, in that encounter are inextricably uh, mixed. Um, was that your first uh, like uh, literary or, or poetry memory? There was a lot of poetry in the house where I grew up mm -hmm. that I didn't, of, of which I didn't take notice for a long time because it was sort of elemental. It was there all the time. Uh, but it is one of the very, my, I would say it is, it is among my first attempts at writing a poem. I'd, I'd, I'd written one or two, I think, when I was 13. When did you start to identify yourself as a poet? That happened after I tried on a lot of other sort of creative hats. When I was a kid, I seemed to have a knack f for a number of different things. Both my parents were actors. Mm -hmm. It was assumed that I would be an actor. Uh, I could draw well. Uh, uh, I was drawn to photography. And yet, when each of these things became real work, uh, I, would, uh, I would sour on them. <laughs> Somewhere around the age of 27, uh, I began to write poetry in earnest without knowing that I was doing it, without deciding I'm going to go write a poem now. I looked up one day in a cafe in London and realized that for weeks, I had been going to this same place and writing, and what I was writing was not a song, and it wasn't a story. It was not interested in information. It was, it, I'd seemed to be preoccupied with an emotional vocabulary. Uh, and so there was first the realization that I had been doing this and that I didn't know what else to call it. And then perhaps more significantly was that I stayed with it after the encouragement dried up and after it became real work. So right around the age of 27, all of these things happen uh, that convinced me, oh, this is it. And that was good because you have written, uh, I think, nine books of poetry. Oh, my goodness. Uh, um, yes, more, nine, ten books. The last, or the, the latest ones uh, are um, Letters to Guns with Red Hand Press, uh, 2009. Uh, Birthday Girl with Possum, 2011, with uh, Right Bloody Press, and Calamity Joe is the latest book, also with uh, Red Hand Press. That's right. Um, I would like to um, uh, you to do like a little um, preview of each book, like like in the movies. Okay, sure. So, for example, if I say uh, Letters to Guns, what what is Letters to Guns? This tradition of writing letters to guns is something that has existed since we've had guns and in fact, since we've had gunpowder, and you may not have known about it, uh, and that I'm presenting these letters here as a way to sort of bring you up to date with this, this long 
uh, tradition of, of writing. And, that, um, and so the letters appear not only uh, 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 evenly spaced throughout the book, but I, I tell you at the beginning that uh, I, they're not going to appear chronologically, but in an order of discovery. Uh, and uh, and uh, so there's, there's, you know, there's kind of a fantastic yeah, world. like the, the frame within. for the... For Indeed. The and, uh, What's about uh, <clears throat> Birthday Girl with Possum? Uh, a theme began to emerge as I started to collect poems for it, and then uh, I realized that in many ways it emulated uh, uh, everything that I, I, I love and despair about parties. At a good party, you'd meet people from all over the world and from different walks of life. And also, at a good party, you got lots of information, most of which was unreliable, uh, but was very stimulating while you were having the conversations. And so I tried to create a book that would capture, uh, uh, that, that would, that would capture the experience of meeting different people and so people show up throughout the book and sort of introduce themselves and tell you about them. But also uh, you get these little lectures on certain subjects that are emotionally true but factually a little sketchy so that you do have this sense of, of having been informed when you came out but you really, you're informed more with a feeling of something necessarily than, than, uh, than hard dates. Uh, there's a lecture in there on Albert Einstein. There's yeah, one on the way the brain works. A lot of lectures, yeah. Uh, but then, uh, and, and then in addition to this, there's, um, uh, there is, I hope, a good measure of, of uh, both, in equal measure, the, the uh, euphoria and total disappointment of having your birthday. Uh, and uh, I hope that those are sort of embodied in the book. And again, this kind of thread. And what about the, the most recent one, uh, Calamity Joe? The book begins with a cast in order of disappearance. Uh, Joe is, uh, 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 speaks throughout the book. Joe is the, uh, uh, is the sort of pen name of this mysterious character who works in a laboratory and has these strange sort of magical experiences and interpretations of them. It's not I didn't want to necessarily create another novel in verse, but I hoped that by the end of the book you would have a sense of a complete psychology, uh, that it would be that you would have met someone. When you write, you have this element of surprise, and also when you answer the questions, there's this kind of element of surprise. So. Uh, you mentioned that both your parents uh, were actors, uh, Michael Constantine Correct. and uh, Juliana McCarthy. Mm. Who are your uh, poetry parents? Who are my poetry parents? Mm -hmm. Well, interestingly enough, I would have to say they are as well. Poetry uh, was very important to them. My mother was dedicated to the poetry of uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins and uh, as well as uh, Kenneth Patchen and... Uh, and my father, uh, uh, in equal measure, loved Shakespeare and Edith Sitwell. And uh, Shakespeare was, I think, where they both kind of met in, that, in, in their uh, love of poetry. Uh, the house where I grew up had framed copies of Auden's uh, poems on the wall, and um, Dad... Uh, along with nursery rhymes, taught me, you know, verses. Of, and I didn't even know where some of these verses came from. They were just things my father said. Uh, and uh, I think of uh, pieces from Edith Sitwell's Facade. Uh, uh, and every turbaned chinoiserie with whom we should sip our black bohe would stretch out her simian fingers thin to scratch you, my dears, like a mandolin. I just, you know, walking around at like three or four trying to get my mouth around some of this language. And a great motivation was also I fell in love with a poet. Uh, I struck upon this ruse that I would encourage her to sign up for the same poetry workshop in Los Angeles. And that way I knew that I would at least be able to see her once a week. And so I got her to sign up with me uh, to take a workshop from Suzanne Lummis. Okay. And that's how I met Suzanne Lummis. And uh -huh. she 
was uh, that was that was right place, right time. Just what a what a you know, what a great uh, uh, tour guide to get you to you know somebody to lead you onto the farm, as they used to say. Because so, her enthusiasm was absolutely boundless in the classroom, and she made um, my girlfriend and I you know uh, uh, drunk with poetry. And shortly thereafter, when those classes ended, I met Laurel Ann Bogan, who became a wonderful enabler. And she and Suzanne were, were friends. And, uh, uh, and uh, a couple of years after that, I ran into Cecilia Wallach, who was just an absolute firebrand and a real, uh, I'd say, uh, was like, um, by comparison, was my first sort of drill sergeant in poetry, you know. And I lived you know, to be put down in that fashion, <laughs> to be abused in her classes. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, so she was very much uh, 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 a poetry parent. Well, what about poets from other languages? Because you speak Spanish, you have uh, some knowledge of Greek, I believe. One of the quickest ways I know to, to learn anything is to, uh, is to emulate other people who are doing it. <laughs> and, um, and I was so hungry for poetry that I wanted to, uh, I, just, I just wanted all the poetry I could get my hands on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even when somebody I trusted and respected might hold up a book of poems and say, don't bother with this, this is trash, uh, I would still go through it and go, well, well, why is it trash? I have to know, you know. And, um, and likewise, even poetry that you would think might have presented uh, uh, a problem, maybe a lang in a language I didn't, you know, if I came across a, a book in another language, if I had any reason to believe that it might be poetry, I then went and tried to find somebody who could translate it for me or, you know, and say, well, what are they doing and what are they saying and what, you know, why does the poem look like that on the page? Why is there a break here? Are they doing something different than we do in English? And I'm astounded to this day by how much discourse about poetry and what makes for good poetry and bad poetry if I trace it back, seems to be ultimately tied to a short-sightedness that ultimately thinks that English is the first language of poetry and sort of disregards the examples of poetry that we find in other languages and its history in other languages. And I'm very lucky that I was not brought into poetry with those prejudices. Mm -hmm. uh, poetry uh, was to be looked for wherever you found it. Do you have patterns in your uh, creative process? I do. My motivations uh, and my approaches are different depending on what I'm looking for, but those approaches do have patterns. Uh, there isn't one great pattern, there's, there's a bunch of little ones. And, uh, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm very moody and give, I, I have prejudices that come up. I have, I have, I have an ongoing struggle with self-consciousness, which is of course ultimately the ultimate self-consciousness is a battle with self-consciousness. Uh, and so, you know, so for different moods, uh, you know, there's a poem I'm working on now, right now with this particular poem, it seems to me that um, I'm on a kick where I feel like I, I can't use any conjunctions. Uh, and if this is a poem that wants to come out at a certain time of day and I'm only working on it at a certain time. I'm thinking about it all day, but to work on it in the morning would feel wrong. It needs to be night when I'm less rational. Okay. Uh, and uh, for this particular kind of problem. Then there's other stuff that I'm perfectly happy to work on during the day, and I'm willing to give myself a little more room. Okay, you can say and, and you can say but, and you can say uh, I, uh, but uh, at the same time, you probably shouldn't use any punctuation for this kind of poem. Also, I was thinking if you, like, if you write every day, if you take notes and then you, uh, you organize the notes, if you, <coughs> if mm. you have, like, a, if you write in the computer or you write by hand. Yes, to all, everything. If you yeah, have collections uh, of, of, uh, of poems or then, or they're very kind of uh, individual poems and then you, col you put them in, in collections, that kind of uh, approach. As a writer and a, and a teacher of writing, I'm a big proponent of what I call woodpiling. And a lot of other writers, I think, have different names for it, but they're uh, files, uh, physical and digital, uh, filled with ephemera and debris, <laughs> broken poems, things I've overheard, 
uh, uh, false starts, that kind of thing. I do keep uh, uh, fuel on hand uh, because I don't know, you know, maybe I get caught up in something and a poem's not working or I can't seem to get something to work to fit a, a really good idea I had, but I hang on to it and maybe two, three, four, five, sometimes ten, eleven years later, I'm able to unearth it. Like, oh, I forgot I wrote that I piece see. of language and that might fit here. Uh, I don't have a set time of day. Um, uh, one of the things that ruined my routine was giving up smoking. Since what I consider to be my first formal collection, and the fact that it was so well received, that's also really ruined a lot of my routines and my patterns because now I'm busier than I was. Sometimes I think that's what Henry James is talking about when he talks about the madness of art. It's all of this stuff that's around the art that is not the art itself. And once the art becomes conspicuous uh, and starts drawing attention and people start asking for the art, uh, then the art is sometimes the last thing you have time for, you know, and it's all of this stuff around it. So I've gotten very busy and uh, and I'm thrilled. Knock on wood. I'm not complaining. I have seen you uh, reading many times. And you are very um, active reader. You are very animated. Did you, uh, because I think, well, you, uh, you were an actor. You also had a, I don't know if you have a band or if you used to have a band. Is yeah, I used to sing a, okay. in a band. I was a terrible singer. So you are very animated in your readings. Is that element of oral language, that element of performance, uh, part of the writing process? In other words, uh, do you want the poem to work on the page as well as on the stage? Absolutely, the poem has to work on the page. I, and I want it to be separate from my voice. I want it to work, whatever that means, for whoever reads it, and any tone of voice. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to reading them for an audience, I do believe that I'm asking a great deal of them for their attention. <laughs> and that it is, at the very least, good manners for me to try to make it interesting. Um, and that seems to be uh, uh, a, a place of some contention for artists. What, to what degree are we being true to ourselves? And in the act of being true to ourselves, we tell ourselves we're well, not writing it for the world, you're writing it for you first. And you have to be true to that, otherwise it's all self-consciousness and all you, you're, you're at risk of not writing poetry but merely the opposite of criticism. You know, if you're thinking too much about, you know, what yeah. somebody might say about it or how they... Uh, at the same time, uh, I know that uh, when I'm reading to an audience, they did not break down my door and demand that I read to them. You know, somebody said, can you be entertaining and read your work to these people? Can you entertain a room with them? So I have to choose pieces and I have to figure out how I'm going to present them. We're with so many things competing for our time and our attention. I think that it is, it's on my shoulders to, to, to make it interesting. And if I'm going to read a number of poems, I probably shouldn't read them all in the same tone of voice you know, exactly, identically the entire way, Those are, that's going to make sure that, you know, nobody has any sense of anything that happened to them. They're going to, you know, that's, that becomes hypnosis, you know, and so I should maybe try to vary things a little bit and, you know, no less than, you know, I'm talking to you now. I mean, imagine if this was, you know, yes, Mariano, <laughs> I had many heroes in poetry. Uh, in your poetry, we can find, uh, we can find a lot of uh, modern or modern elements or elements of the modernity like you have a lot of fragmentation uh, you have borrowing from non-literary texts like the I think you have something from the power and water uh, oh yes. yes okay so you have borrowing you have fragmentation you have uh, like found poetry um, I also think you have elements from the Dada movement like Tristan Sarah or this kind of absurdity um, you also have a lot of um, playfulness, uh, uh, elements of surprise. Mm. I think you, you like to, to play with surprise. Do you recognize uh, yourself when, uh, when you hear all these uh, uh, descriptions? I was not always aware of the humor that people... <laughs> Fine. You know, sometimes I was, <laughs> I, was, I was breaking my own heart here on the page and somebody, you know, saying like, oh, that's hilarious. And that's, you know, re really? I'm certainly aware, you know, of absurdity in, in my work. It isn't necessarily what I'm striving for. Everybody from whom I've learned may be present in my poetry, whether I'm conscious of it or not. But what I'm, but really all I'm conscious of is, is 
trying to find whatever works for that thing that is floating just outside my head and how it wants to come out. It may require fragmented language. It may require a, you know, a series of super associations, or it may just be all it is. Mm -hmm. But there is a serious aspect in your poetry. And the more I read your poems, the more I encounter this uh, seriousness and almost this connection with uh, social awareness. Mm. There is one poem I, I would like you to read um, from your book, uh, Birthday Girl with uh, Possum. Okay. I think it's called um, the Bla A Little Black. The children of Juarez have run out of red crayons. There's so much blood in their eyes, the bodies of mules dumped in their schools, hands and heads by the road, blood in pools, blood in stories of blood. Before I know it, I'm planning my own crime, the worst a poet can commit, to steal suffering, call it mine. How vivid, I think, what a strong detail on which to build. I open my computer, the great self-making book of our age, search for more of the story, for the words run out of red crayons. I find children out of red in Pakistan, in Haiti, no red left in Afghanistan, none in Georgia. The children of Sierra Leone have gone through pink to purple. In Myanmar, they're down to brown. I thought I had something to add. I have nothing to add but a little black, the color of the line, color that consumes all others. You toured the, the state of California with a grant from the James Urban Foundation. I did, yes. I did, I was very lucky. So, um, uh, which kind of tendencies do you, do you see uh, in the California or in the Los Angeles poetry scene? Wow, uh, no one knows where Los Angeles begins or ends. Los Angeles is largely mythological, it, uh, uh, <laughs> and there are these great centers of activity throughout the city and thriving communities of poetry that all technically inhabit the same city, but that are strangely isolated from one another and have very little discourse with one another. Um, and what I notice and what I have noticed about Los Angeles is that, um, is that we've, got, we've got wonderful scenes and we have little revolutions taking place all the time. And there do seem to be territories that are given to different kinds of poetry and different approaches. Now, of course, uh, clearly 20 years ago, we should have all bought stock in coffee. Uh, coffee houses seem to have made an enormous difference <laughs> and join the city together in its poetry communities. It, you know, each one is like, uh, is like an embassy uh, in a different poetry territory, and we have a way to sort of navigate them. If you go to a, an open mic poetry reading at a gallery, at a bookstore, at a coffee house, uh, you're not going to see just one kind of poetry. You're going to see a variety of different things. Yeah, I would like you to choose one poem from your uh, latest book, uh, Calamity Joe. Oh, sure. What are you going to read? I'm going to read a short poem, but I'm also going to read you the two quotes that open the book. The first quote is from Frederick Nietzsche and goes like this. What is done out of love lies beyond good and evil. And this from Tolstoy. Frederick Nietzsche was stupid and abnormal. This is difficult listening time. A flock of pink flamingos moved in across the street and set up plastic people on the lawn. They've faced them out this way, hands molded to their chins, looking more like us as night comes on. Downtown, the waitresses are starving in their aprons. The watchmen get fainter by the hour. It's difficult listening time, object response time, time for the tears of things. There has to be a way to help it along, a way to dry the rain as it falls so we can keep these clothes. Let's go to the woods 
and hang a painting of this room on every tree. We'll go to sea and on each sailboat fix a picture of a hotel bed. Or how about we stay home and talk out every song between us until we sound like heavy, stupid birds. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.